Okay, so now, um, if you can release the screen from your end, I will actually thank you very much for the presentation. So now we move on to our uh, last best paper candidate. Um, please feel free to share your screen. Christos, I believe you're online. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear okay. you. Uh, so please feel free to share your screen and full screen mode. And uh, you hear, do you, you see the presentation? We see the presentation and we see you. So okay, uh, great. Thank you very much. So uh, uh, yeah, I'll just introduce you and then <laughs> you can go ahead. So um, again, this is uh, our uh, final candidate for the best paper award. Last but not least, it's just the ordering, as we mentioned, is going to be um, in person and then followed by remote presentations. So uh, we have Christus here to present to us uh, micro TL a very interesting paper on transfer learning uh, from Chalmers University of Technology. Christos, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you for uh, the presentation. And without delaying, because I'm holding you from dance, I will uh, go on for the presentation. So uh, I will start to, by uh, the motivation about uh, why we uh, look into this uh, particular problem and uh, where everything started is that nowadays we see that the current trend is to aggregate data to the cloud and have a centralized approach for machine learning. But uh, this uh, uh, actually is uh, shifting because of the privacy issues. And it's not just uh, the researchers that look into it, it's also the companies that uh, uh, have uh, look into alternatives for uh, centralized approach of uh, cloud aggregation of the data and uh, machine learning. Uh, and uh, one particular uh, approach that we look into is on-device learning. Uh, and uh, uh, this comes because uh, IoT uh, devices have a lot of data and we can locally proceed in real time. And uh, by applying on-device learning, you see this local personalization towards the device and the user is um, more happy than uh, knowing that uh, uh, big companies in the cloud can make assumptions about uh, what time we eat, uh, where we travel, uh, photos that we uh, take uh, in uh, uh, our holidays. So uh, this is the motivation. And uh, uh, there is a challenge, however, like, uh, trying to bring uh, traditional algorithms that run in uh, uh, cloud nodes that where resources are abundant. And also the system is quite complicated. You cannot just take the algorithm and put it in uh, a low power device with uh, 256 kilobytes of RAM. Uh, as I say, cloud has abundant resources and the data is easy to be transferred. Uh, on the other end, the, resource, uh, the resources are constrained on these uh, IoT devices, and uh, the bandwidth is limited. You cannot uh, 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 take data, and if you considering that IoT devices communicate with each other, uh, you don't have so much uh, uh, easy access to the data. Uh, and also you need to have a clean design. So uh, uh, the moment that you put something on the, de the device and becomes an application, you cannot ask for more RAM or CPU compared to the cloud where on demand you can ask uh, always more resources. So with that, uh, we propose micro TL on device transfer learning. Uh, the goal is to have on-device learning with local data. And we do that by tailoring transfer learning for these devices. And uh, uh, I need to point out here, this is not the full-fledged learning, it's uh, you uh, retrain parts of the network. So um, our contribution is that we enable, of course, transfer learning, but also we saw that it's feasible to take parts of deep neural networks and retraining on really low power out the devices. And the main reason that 
a benefit that you do that is that you can adapt dynamically to changes of your initial problem because nowadays that uh, when you deploy a deep neural network, uh, they, uh, usually you never change it. So, so you train a model, you put it on an IoT device, and you do some kind of inference for your application to classify uh, pictures or audio. But uh, as we all know, is uh, IoT applications are quite dynamic. Uh, we can see it, and trust learning can help you by uh, taking a, an existing problem and uh, sift it a little bit. So moving on to show you uh, actually how this looks like on the device is like uh, there's two steps involved. One is that uh, uh, during inference you you uh, collect uh, uh, intermittent outputs from the inference layers. This is can be a convolution layer or can be a RNN on the device, uh, recurrent run actor. And this is a, a compressed format because it's integers. So you collect a lot of the data and you only decompress the data when you actually you want to train. And I need to repeat again, we train here uh, the last two layers, which is the fully connected layers. We don't train, train the whole network. Uh, and this gives you the benefit of uh, just applying, uh, like decompressing the data only during training. And because it's, we use, uh, it's typical to use mini bats uh, graded descent where you take a small number of uh, data each time to train your network. Uh, this is quite feasible. Uh, however, this uh, sounds nice, but uh, during uh, I, I, the actual experiments, we saw that uh, the main problem is that, uh, wh like, why, why, why I do this? Why I compress and decompress the data? This is the main question here that I try to answer. It's like, um, when you quantize the quantize network, you, you have integers, so you don't have a smooth uh, curve to take gradients. And uh, you can see the outputs are deviating. And this works for inference, but for learning, you need to calculate the gradients. So our solution was to reverse uh, the quantized outputs. Uh, and uh, this looks like, uh, uh, like this image can look complicated, but we apply this to quantize function. And when we say Q shift is a fancy word to, to say that uh, your data needs to be aligned on a zero point because uh, from when you have a domain from integer to float, the zero point can shift. So this Q shift is just to align the zero point, which is really important for activation function in neural networks. And then you have a scale factors that uh, uh, takes integers and uh, make it to float. And actually this avoids the main problem of uh, vanishing gradients, because if you keep uh, your data in integers, uh, it's hard, really hard to train. And again, since we, train only the last part of the network, uh, we find out that this is feasible. And also you, you have an efficient storage. So it's uh, uh, quite beneficial to, to keep this structure. So uh, we actually uh, test our algorithm in a real hardware in a, uh, low power developing board. Uh, this is an NRF52, and this is a common chipset that you can find in your smartwatch. So you can imagine like the application scenario can be that uh, your smartwatch already been trained for uh, uh, 10 applications, 10 activities, running, biking, swimming, uh, going to the gym, but the, you don't want all of these actions and a user maybe it's more into running and another user is more into biking. So you just collect a small amount of samples from 100 from the user and you retrain the network locally with the device. So this actually can be the application scenario here. 
And uh, the interesting results that we find is that uh, there is a big trade-off of the energy you need to consume and the accuracy that uh, you can achieve. And in the first graph, we see that uh, uh, we don't have a lot of resources, so you will not do so much fine tuning. So you will not run for 20 epochs. You will uh, apply early stopping in practice and you stop in the 10th epoch and uh, uh, you will be happy with your accuracy that you receive. Uh, so there is a lot of more things to look into the future about how you uh, find the sweet point where you stop, where you train and how much training you actually can achieve. And that becomes more interesting because the inference part that you collect the data, it, it happens on uh, the digital signal process of the device, which actually consumes, uh, uh, I mean, can draw more current than the float point unit where we, we do uh, the training. And again, I need to remind you that I train uh, the last part of the network. If you want to train, the whole network uh, will be quite costly. So we avoid this approach. And uh, uh, there is more things to look into more advanced algorithms, how you can actually uh, take these results and utilize uh, new approach. So I want to uh, conclude this by uh, saying that what we propose is uh, and what we saw is uh, transferring or low priority devices. We saw that it's feasible to not just doing inference, but uh, you apply learning on really uh, constrained devices. Uh, and the, the main benefit that, I, uh, that uh, is good for the user is that uh, you address a, a big privacy issue because again, nowadays, uh, even with all these methods that uh, uh, we try to propose for uh, federating learning and others, the, the still cloud collects a lot of data from us. And uh, <laughs> we don't know how uh, the companies are using it. Uh, however, yeah, cloud services are still important. Uh, you need to somehow, uh, at the end, uh, incorporate uh, your IoT device with the cloud because you don't have the resources. And, um, I think with that, I can take uh, your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. Uh, so questions from the audience? I actually have one to, uh, to start, Krista. So uh, you kind of uh, semi-answered it with the very last uh, line on slide number 10. Uh, I mean, the point of trying to do this transfer learning on the low power IoT devices makes sense. But you also, as you mentioned, there a lot of this data is already collected on cloud services. Now with the edge uh, and fog networks, you know, we already have significant computing resources close to the edge. So what is the main motivation for trying to do this transfer learning on the IoT devices themselves? Given that they move, they have you know, serious mobility issues, they have, you know, constrained resources and so on. So the main motivation is that uh, some data is not available uh, before you actually, the user start using the device. Like, uh, uh, for example, I live in Sweden, you, I ski in, in the winter, but uh, my smartwatch uh, doesn't know this. And uh, some data is available after actually I start using the device. Yep. And uh, this is also uh, depending depending the kind of data that you want to send to the data, it can be quite expensive actually to transfer the data to the cloud. And uh, uh, I mean, it's not like uh, I try to abandon cloud, but it can be a win-win approach while like uh, uh, when a device uh, needs to uh, balance the small battery that they have and try to preserve energy. They can apply like uh, some transfer learning, but uh, when you have a lot of ba battery and you're at home, you can just download a new model. So it's not like I just abandon cloud services. So I think it could be a win-win approach. 
Sure. So the, the, the two main targets were basically conserving on the battery power, but also uh, having more responsiveness in the system, right? So yeah. that you don't have to wait until you do this offline. So perhaps uh, maybe even in future work, do you have certain directions of dissecting different types of services, which ones should be uh, done locally using transfer learning on the IoT devices, which ones should be transferred to an edge or a fog network? So the the thing is that uh, if you have uh, um, uh, like uh, human activity where you uh, have time series data, and, uh, this data is actually not so big. So you your local edge can uh, uh, actually process them faster. But if you have uh, uh, data that needs uh, some kind of images. Uh, can be quite expensive, actually, and uh, and, and also the, uh, one thing to consider here is that sometimes you throw data, or because of lack of communication and uh, not so much memory, the device actually will uh, need to uh, throw some data. So I think images are more important to consider here than uh, uh, like if you have time series, maybe you can compress it and yep. send, send it faster. Thanks, Risa. So there's one more a question from the floor. Yeah. Uh, so thank you for the presentation. Uh, so like I have uh, two quick questions. So the first one is that like, uh, did you like compare between transfer learning like conducted on IoT devices and like learning techniques uh, basically that can be run on the cloud? I mean, in terms of accuracy, and the second question is how you can foresee uh, like the collaboration between both transfer learning on IoT devices and the cloud services. Okay, thank you. So, yeah, actually, I I I, I'm, I compare the accuracy with. I mean, again, we need to consider here that uh, no matter if you do transfer learning on the device or on the cloud, at the end, you need to quantize your network on uh, the device. So one detail that maybe I didn't, uh, it's addressed on the paper and you can read it, is that my fully connected layers at the end is still in floating point. So I can achieve a little bit better accuracy than having a totally quantized network. So the I can, Compared to the cloud, I, I have like a benefit about this, but uh, uh, at the end of the day, the cloud will always outperform you. You just save uh, energy by not uh, communicating, and uh, that's the main benefit. So the collaboration with the cloud usually is about uh, like I'm not sure. Actually, I'm looking into how how the cloud can know uh, what data is important on the device and you can actually decide if I need to send this device and training you network from scratch or I, you know, it happens you have already a network on your device, let's utilize it, do some transfer learning and achieve better accuracy for, uh, you know, till uh, a new version of the software is available. So yeah, this is a hard question, I think. I Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christos. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so with that, we wrap up our uh, best paper candidate session. Thank you to all of the presenters and authors and obviously the attendees. We really appreciate it. We now break for the lunch.